yes, I do feel unlovable at times. And I have to remember that they're lies. Absolutely. I think I know I am loved when I am at my hardest to deal with and those around me are there for me and they're patient and they still love me through the situation. I think that that is what makes me feel loved and what makes me know that I am loved. I come from a broken family and so I wasn't exposed to what a loving father, I wasn't exposed to uh, that type of love. So I questioned whether I was lovable or not many times in my life. Over the course of a lifetime, there's lots of times when I have felt unlovable and I look at him and I don't know why he or anyone else would want to be with me because I'm a mess. The points in time in my life where I have felt unlovable is because um, it feels as if people are not accepting of who I am and who God created me to be, but actually want me to be something else of their expectations. I guess, I guess if I could put it into one word, being loved by God makes me feel like I have worth. Amen, let's give the Lord a big hand. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. What's up, Rock Church? What's up, Rock Church? How y'all doing today? Uh, is it raining outside? Yep, yep, yep. Hey, uh, let's everybody say East County. Say, what's up, North County? Say, what's up, San Isidro? What's up, City Heights? North County? Let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. Lord, thank you for today. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us today. I pray that your burden would be our burden. And I pray that people who feel distant from your love would feel close to your love. And I pray for the people here today, people watching online, people on, at our campuses, at our microsites, would sense your presence in their life. And I pray that we would represent your love to everybody we know and acknowledge there are people around us who feel so distant from you. I pray you would break our heart for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you move, before you move, I want you to look to the person next to you and say two things. I want you to, one, tell them you need to know that God loves you and I'm here for you. Just say that to them, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Someone say Jesus. Jesus. Let's lift your Bibles up today at Church and Rock Church on three. Say word. One, two, three. Word. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. First book of the New Testament. And we're going to read Matthew 9, 9 to 13. We're going to read 9, 9 to 13. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said, follow me. Everyone say, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? The unlovable. And when Jesus heard that, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We started a series called Love Wins about three weeks ago. Love being defined as the heart of God, the passion of God. God's desire to aggressively pursue you and overwhelm you with his amazing plan for your life. That's God's love. 
We define love as the heart of God, not some feeling we have, but the passion of God that every single one of you would be transformed into his image, that every single one of you would understand why he created you, his blessings in your life, that you would experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, the fruit or evidence of the spirit in your life. That's God's heart. He created the heavens and the earth based on his love, and it's beautiful and amazing and comfortable, and especially for all of y'all who don't live in San Diego, we have more of God's love in our weather than you do. <laughs> I talk to my friends back east, and it's like cold and rainy, and I'm like, well, it's 75 again. But God's love is in the, in the winter as well. I just don't get that, but that's a, uh, uh, in the cold and the heat. Yet there are so many people who feel unlovable. There are people right now listening, you don't feel lovable. We define, uh, in your lesson plan, I've defined unlovable as God being unwilling to love you because of something you did. He's not willing to bless you and answer your prayers and listen to you. You feel distant from God. Or God unable to love you because something you did or something that happened to you, you've been struggling with a disease, you've been struggling with loneliness, you've been praying out for a man or a woe man, or maybe you've been praying out for both. A new house, a new car, a new job. And you just feel like, you know, I'm not feeling the love from God. And why is that? And, I, and, I, and, and there are people sitting around you right now, and people that you have known for a long time, and they put on a happy face and they go about their business and maybe they're going about life and everything seems good. But in their heart they feel like, you know what, I don't feel satisfied. And they come to church. And people come to church, whether it be this church or other churches, and no one talks to them. And, and they don't feel encouraged. They don't feel any different. They don't sense anything different. And they just go through the motions. And yet God is saying, I, I, I sent my son and he died on the cross to prove his love for you. How come you don't get that? The Bible says in Romans 8 that God, that, that nothing can snatch us out of his hands and nothing can separate us from the love of God, yet we don't get that. And that God's, God's love covers a multitude of sin, 1 Peter 4, 8, and yet somehow we still feel distant from God. I told you a few weeks ago that I was a burden preacher. and that Every sermon I got I to gotta not only have information, but more importantly to me, I have to know what is, the, what is God's burden what, what breaks God's heart that he wants me to passionately plead for? And what breaks God's heart that he want, wants you to have a burden for? And today's burden is that I don't want anybody to not know that God loves them. I was driving here this morning and I saw in different places homeless people walking around just lonely, by themselves, dirty clothes. And one guy had a... a, a, a carriage and he was pushing a carriage with all the stuff in it, which I would imagine was all that he owns. I would only guess that, but I assume that. And he's walking with all these layers of, of dirty clothes thinking, man, that must break God's heart. I wonder if it breaks your heart. I wonder if it breaks your heart that the person next to you could feel a million miles from the love of God and, and today may be their last day on earth, their last ditch effort. That they're just, they're just not getting it. And my burden is that you would get it, that you would not only understand that God loves you, I can tell you that, and you've heard it, but that you would experience it. I have this little chart in your lesson plan that talks about Santa Claus love versus agape love. And this is something I'm just going to br briefly mention. It's something you could talk, think about, uh, read about later and, and look at later. But sa some people have a thing called what I call Santa Claus love, things on the left. That one, love is conditional. I can earn it or deserve it. In other words, I, if, if I do certain things, and number two says I can get what I want. If I do certain things, God's going to love me. If I do certain things or I am something, if I'm pretty, if I make money, if, some, if I wear certain clothes, that I am going to be loved. It's conditional love. It's Santa Claus. I'm going to be good, I get this. And number two, it says I get what I want. I can actually negotiate with God. That if I do something, love should be reciprocated by me getting something. It's bad. That's, not, that's not the love of the Bible. God will love me if I do so and so. God loves you anyway, by the way. 
It has nothing to do with you. God's love is not based on you. In the, in the Old Testament when God delivered the Israelites, he says, I'm delivering you into the promised land not because of anything you've done. It's because of who I am. Do you know that God doesn't love you because of you? Everyone say, God doesn't love me because of me. Santa Claus love says, you know what, if I am good, what do you, what do you tell our kids on Christmas? If you're good, Santa's going to give you something. One, there's no Santa, it's you. And, and then they translate that, that if I'm good, then God will love me. God loves you whether you're good or not. This is something you need to understand. If you look on the right, God's love, agape love is unconditional. Say unconditional. That means that even when you're bad, God loves you. Now, so you say, well, what about punishment? Well, let me tell you something. God loves you even in that. Because in our mind, we think loving, when God loves me, I get good things. When God doesn't love me, I get bad things. You need to understand 24-7, even when you feel distant from God, even when things aren't going right in your life, God is still loving you. And what God is doing is he is trying to guide you and direct you towards himself. And that his love for you is not based on you. And then you don't have to walk around with a burden thinking, I gotta be pretty, more pretty, I gotta be uh, more in shape, I gotta be more intelligent. If I, I gotta be, I gotta do these good things, and then God will love me. No, 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 stop that. Stop that. That's the devil. You cannot earn God's love, it's unconditional. And we carry around so many burdens of trying to get God's love or get man's approval. And God says, listen, stop, stop, stop. There's nothing you can do to change my love for you. There's nothing you can do to make me love you more. There's nothing you can do to make me love you less. This is God's love. And you're not going to get what you want all the time. You not getting what you want all the time doesn't mean I don't love you. Because what you want is not always good for you. How many of you dated somebody you really, really wanted? Come to find out it really wasn't what you should have had. Can I get an Amen. I mean, my goodness, oh, I got, I, got, I, got, I got to have him. I got to have her. Oh, man, I'll just be the happiest. And then six months later, you like want to kill him. Or you want to kill yourself. <laughs> God says, it's not about me giving you what you want. My love is about giving what you need. My love is based on me knowing you inside and out. My love is based on me blessing you. And my love is always just. My love is always just. In this story we're going to read, Matthew is a tax collector. He is part of the class of the unlovable. In Jesus' time, there were two groups of people. There were the orthodox people who obeyed the letter of the law, and they were, uh, they were the religious uh, uh, orthodox, and they, and they were self-righteous. They were separated from everybody else. And they said, here's what's right, here's what's wrong, here's what's right, here's what makes you unclean, here's what makes you clean, religiously. Here's what makes you, uh, 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 you are uh, 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 allowable to come into the temple. You are allowable to serve. And if you did these things or had these problems in your life, you are unclean, unlovable, untouchable. You need to be ostracized. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew, Matthew worked for the government and he would collect taxes. But because the, the, the government was corrupt and the tax collectors were corrupt, in Jewish law, you were allowed to lie to them and, you, and they were not permitted in the temple. They were unclean. They were unlovable. They were ostracized. Can't come to church. I had someone come in recently and he said, my, 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 my uh, uh, um, nephew is gay. Can he come to your church? I'm not a Christian. Can I come to your church? I got this problem. Can I come? Everybody can come. Everybody. Say everybody. everybody. Say everybody. everybody. Why? Because God loves everybody. Now, let, let's, let's be clear. In our culture... When we think God loves me and when we think you love me, we translate that to me, you're going to do what I want. You're going to give me what I want. That's not what it is. And if you don't give me what I want, you don't love me. That's what our culture has translated into love. God says, no, no, I love you based on me, God says. It's not based on you. And my love is based on justice. My love is based on my heart. This is what God said. And my love is going to transform you into what I created you to be. It has nothing to do with what your desires are unless those desires come from me. It's all about God. So we're all welcome here, not because of anything we are, because we're all sinners. Everyone say, I'm a sinner. Not, not me, you. You. <laughs> you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Oh, yes, I am. But everyone say, I am a sinner. Pat your chest and say, I'm a sinner. 
And God loves you anyway. So, so, so Jesus is walking around and Jesus says, I'm going to tell you I love everybody all day long. And for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. For God so loved the world, not because the world was good, but because the world was lost. God loved the world because of who God was. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you that, but I'm going to show you. So in this story, Jesus is walking around, and he says to this, ma- this tax collector, Matthew, follow me. And the, and the, and the religious are going to say, wait a minute, that guy is unclean. He's, a, he's not, you don't associate with that guy. He's outside the sphere of God's love. And look what it says. It says in verse 9, let me read it again. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said, follow me. And he arose. And it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house. Now, in Luke chapter 5, the same story is written. And it says that Jesus actually went to his house. It was his house, Matthew's house. And he sat at the table. And look what it says. It says, it happened as Jesus was at the table that many tax collectors and sinners, or the unlovable, the outcasts, came and sat down with him and his disciples. So here's Jesus sitting at the table. And you got Matthew, he's unlovable because he's a tax collector. You got this girl over here that's got an issue of blood. She's unlovable because she's unclean because she's got a blood flow and you can't touch her or touch anything she touches. You got this sexually immoral person. You got this drunkard. You got this person who's an idolater. You got this person who's extortion. All these people who are unlovable. And Jesus says, I'm not even going to tell you. I'm going to sit down and eat with you. And they're hanging out and he's loving them. And all of them are sitting in their mind. I wasn't there, obviously, but I got to believe they're sitting in there going, man, those religious people would never do this with us. This guy's different. This needs to be you. Everybody in your world needs to know you love them before they know what you know about the Bible. A lot of times we're like, well, here the Bible says this, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. And everybody knows believers about what they're against but not what they're for. And the one thing, if, there's, if there is one thing, by the way, above everything about you that they should know is that you love them. It doesn't mean you approve of them. People think, well, if, I, if I'm nice to this person and they're evil, they're going to think I approve of their behavior. That's the devil getting in your head. You should, you should say, Lord, what I want to know, if I'm a disciple, you shall, they shall know you are my disciples by your love for one another, that you actually Love them. So here's Jesus sitting at the table and all these people around. And again, I wasn't there, but they're tripping going, man, this dude's hanging out with us. When I first got saved, uh, I went back to New York. I got saved out here. I went back to New York where I'm from. And a friend of mine had a party. And I used to smoke weed, marijuana, pot, ganja. And I went to this party and everyone's upstairs getting high, which is what I did. All my friends upstairs getting high in, in this in the house, and I said, I'm going to go downstairs. And I went downstairs and sat at the table, at the dining room table, and started talking about Jesus. Now, what I remember about this time is that I didn't know a whole lot about Jesus. And what I remember is that the table was surrounded by everybody at the party, and we were, I shouldn't say arguing, we were having a lively debate about Jesus. And I, 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 I do know that I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew a whole lot. And here these guys around, and Jesus is around there talking with them. And look what it says in the Bible. It says, verse 11, when the Pharisees, the religious orthodox, the, the upright, matter of fact, Pharisee meant separated one. They would separate themselves from the unlovable. When they saw Jesus hanging out, they said, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because he loved them. God wants to eat with you. I don't, it, it does not matter what you have ever done in your life. And it does not matter what you've ever experienced in your life. It does not matter what has ever happened to you in your life. There's some of you in here, the way people treat you reinforces in your head that you are not lovable. You've been violated. You've been abused. You've been, you've been denied opportunity. You think people are against you. There's something wrong with you. It does not matter. God says, I want to sit with you. I want to sit with you. And it says, verse 11, Why does your teacher sit and eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, huh, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. Uh, If there's nothing wrong with you and you're perfect, you don't need God. Matter of fact, if there's something wrong with you and you're perfect, you should not, you don't need to come to church. I guess you can come here to encourage the rest of us and we should worship you. So we should put your name in the Bible. 
Why does your teacher, Jimmy, come and sit with tax collectors? <laughs> I mean, maybe we should do that. Jesus says, those, verse 12, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go learn what this means. And he said, make this clear. Understand what this means. He says, my desire is mercy. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In your notes, uh, God is absolutely willing to love you. God wants to love you. But you have to come to him. When he called Matthew, Matthew's sitting there. Matthew has heard all the chirp. Matthew knows he's been hated. And Matthew knows he's been ostracized. And he says, you know what? Those religious people don't love me. They're over there. I'm over here. They, they can have their life. I'll have my life. And I can't get in Matthew's head, but I wonder if he was convinced God doesn't love me or I'm not going to, or that, that world is not for me. I'm going to take the money side. I'm going to take the corrupt side. And Jesus comes and says, no, no, I'm willing to be with you. I'm willing to love you. There's some of you out there, you have done something and you think God is not willing to love you. He's not willing to extend his forgiving hand into your life. He is. But you have to follow him. He said, Matthew, walk away from your life right now and follow me. God is willing. Look in your notes. Number one, God is willing if only you would sit down with him. In other words, God's saying to you right now, I don't know what you thought when you came here. You may be going through the religious motions, but your heart hurts. You have emptiness. You don't sense the presence of God in your life. You think it's just some religious steps. I go to church, I read my Bible, I go to small group, uh, I, I go to life class, life class starts today, go to life class. But does God really have a purpose for me? Can God send someone into my life that really will love me and care for me? God is willing. You have to understand that. And you may be saying, Miles, you, you, don't, you, don't, you have no idea what I've been through. I don't have to. I know that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for everybody and everything. And he's saying to you today, I don't want you to walk around feeling like I'm distant from you. I don't want you to walk around feeling like I'm not extending, aggressively reaching out to you to love you and encourage you. He's willing. And number two in your notes, he is able. If only you would reach out to him. One of the reasons some people feel unlovable is that they have something in their life they've been crying out to God forever to change. And God has not changed. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to saying we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and God hasn't removed this sickness. We prayed and we prayed and God hasn't brought me a mate. We prayed and prayed and God hasn't brought me this. That does not mean God does not love you. There was a lady in the Bible, Hannah, she couldn't have a baby. She was praying and praying for a baby. God, why would you give me a baby? And she prayed, God, if you give me a son, finally she prayed, if you give me a son, I'll surrender him back to you and he'll serve you all the days of his life. And she got pregnant. She had Samuel. Doesn't mean that if you say, God, I'll give him back to you, you're going to get what you asked for. But the lesson is this. God wants you to have what he wants you to have, not what you want to have. And he is willing to bless you. And if you look in the story right below in Matthew chapter, eight, uh, chapter 9, verse 18, there's a woman with an issue of blood. And in this story, this woman has a disease. Or, well, she has an a issue of blood. She bled for 12 years straight, ladies. Um, I can't relate to that. I don't, we don't understand, us fellows don't understand your cycle stuff. I pray for you, ladies. I pray for you. Uh, just as a parenthetical thought, ladies, uh, you know, I'm, when I saw my wife go through labor, I was really... Um, my wife has been in labor three times. And the first time she was in labor 12 hours. This was our first child. Second child, uh, 24 hours. And I, I always thought labor was supposed to go down. Like the more you had kids, the less, the quicker the labor was. So I figured maybe she had sin in her life or something. God was pushing. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I'm only joking, but at the time I was wondering what was going on. Because the first one went from 12 hours to 24 hours, then 24 hours to 49 hours. 49 hours! My head, my son's head was stuck for five hours. It started to come out five hours. The brother had a, he had a very large skull. Not abnormally, he just had a big head. Um, it wasn't like deformed or anything. Um, but I, I remember saying, God, thank you that I'm not a woman. 
because I couldn't take that pain. You know, I think pound for pound women are stronger than guys. That's just my opinion. Y'all deal with stuff. Amen. <laughs> Woo, celebrate. Go ahead, please, celebrate. Y'all can celebrate it. Celebrate it. God bless you. God bless you. And y'all a lot of times get the raw end of the stick in relationships. You get the raw end of the stick in children, childbearing and taking care of children. Men treat you horribly. And it's, it's, it's sad. And God has given you strength like nobody's business. When I see single, here are single moms working, taking care of their kids, God bless you. God bless you. When I hear women being subjected to knucklehead guys all the time, God bless you. My wife was subjected to a knucklehead guy for four years before that guy married her. <laughs> God bless her. And she always reminds me. No lie. She's like, yeah, you remember back when you were tripping. That's her line, when you were tripping. If you go to my wife, you ever see my wife say, tell me about when your husband when Miles was tripping. She was like, how much time you got? It was four years of tripping. I feel bad that I did that to her. In this, in this story, this woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. And when a woman had an issue of blood, she had to go outside of the town for seven days until it dried up. She was unclean. She couldn't touch anything. If you, she touched it, it became unclean. And you touched it, you became unclean. You couldn't go to temple. You couldn't worship people. Had to, you had to separate yourself from people. This woman had an issue of blood for 12 years straight every day. The Bible says she spent all the money and all the uh, doctors and no one could help her. Let me tell you something. God was loving her still. Sometimes God has to bring us to the end of ourself. And we try everything in our power to get what we want or what we need. And God says, I just want you to trust me. And look what it says in chapter 9, verse 18. I'm sorry, verse uh, 20. Chapter 9, verse 20, it says, Suddenly, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came behind him and touched him in the hem of his garment. Jesus is walking through the crowd, and here's this woman who, by the way, for 12 years was going to doctors, getting called names, was, was unclean for 12 years, was sick. Can you imagine bleeding for 12 years? Was anemic, was weak. Accused of all this sin in her life because she must have sin if she's got this, this problem in her life. And she comes up behind Jesus and she just touches. She says, if only I may touch him, is he willing to love me? Because what she heard about him is that he was forgiving the unforgivable, touching the untouchable, giving sight to the blind, deaf to, uh, hearing to the deaf, sound to the mute. And she said, I think he loves me. People may not love you right. And you may not understand it. You may have a warped understanding of what love God's love is. But God loves you. And it says, she says in verse 20, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said, if only. Everybody say, if only. If only I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Everyone say, daughter. Uh, can you imagine the name she was called? He said, you're not that to me. You're my daughter. Ladies, you are God's daughter. You know, I, meet, I meet women, girls, 20, 30. And I go, oh, that's so cool. You're so young. And they feel so old. I to talk to people. Well, how old are you? I always ask people how old they are. I've got an age thing. I'm 27. I'm going to be 28. I said, do you feel old? Oh, my gosh, I'm getting so old. <laughs> I was talking to somebody the other day. They were 30-something. They were talking about their chin falling. I said, you are such a baby. Not, not baby like, oh, my chin's falling, baby. Just like a baby young. Does your mother even know where you are? <laughs> Can I get an amen for all the people who are older than that? I mean, you're 20, 30. You don't know nothing. You don't. I mean, you, I know you think you do. When I was 20-something, I thought I knew something. When I was 30-something, I thought I knew something. When I was 40-something, I thought you, you know nothing. 
And the world will beat you down. And the devil is on a race to beat you down and make you think you are all these bad names. Jesus said, daughter, my little girl, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour, from that hour. The Bible says in another story, account of the story, she came up behind him trembling when he turned around because she was scared that this woman who was unclean, who was unlovable, who was dirty in the eyes of the world, touched a holy man. And she was worried that she made him dirty. And so when he turned around, because he felt power go out of him, she was like scared, thinking, oh, I'm so sorry I touched, but I had nowhere else to go. And he turned around and said, daughter, your faith has made you well. And what else he was saying was, there's nothing you can do to stain my holiness and impact negatively my love for you. I have so much love and so much ability to love and cure and heal and transform that no matter what you bring to me, I am willing and able to flood you with my love. And when he turned around, this woman was scared. He was saying, lady, all the stuff people have called you, all the stuff you've been through, all the pain you've experienced, I'll take care of it. My love will conquer that. My love will win that over. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the love of God. There's some of you came here with a burden. And, and maybe you didn't even know you had a burden. You just live with a burden. And you, and you accept that this part of your life, it's just like, a, eh, it's annoying. It's a, it's, a, it's a heaviness. It's a distance from God. It's a complacency. And God is saying, I want so much more for you than that. I want you to come sit at the table. Let the religious say what they're going to say. Let the religious say what they're going to say. Those people, I didn't come for them. <laughs> what did Jesus say? I didn't come for the people who think they're well. Miles of Fearson does not think he's well. I'm a sinner too. I need God's grace every day. God wants you to come sit with him. He wants you to say, you know what? I want everything the Bible says God has for me. I want his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his forgiveness, his cleansing power. I want to know my purpose. I want to, I want to walk in the presence of God. I don't just want to go through the motions. I don't want to feel like God is way over there. I want to feel like he's right here. I want to sense his presence, his voice right here. And before I pray, there's some of you out here, you, you've never asked Christ to be your Savior. This is your chance to invite him in. But there are some of you out there, you've asked him, but you still feel distant from him. You still feel like, well, I prayed, I'm going to heaven, but he's really not going to bless me. He's really not going to flood me with his love. No, no, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. God wants you to walk in the spirit. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to obey his voice. He wants to empower your life. He said he would give you the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came upon you, you would have power. That's, what, that's the only thing you should settle for. And if you don't have that, you should seek that with all your heart. Paul says, I press on that I may apprehend what Christ apprehended for me. That you should say, I want that God. I don't want to just be like I'm a Christian by name and just go through my life. That's not what he wants. And for the, and for the rest of y'all out there, there's people around you who are like that. They need to get that sense of love from you. And as simple as this, God loves you. How can I help you? How can I be a blessing to you? You have to be part of that solution. Is that you are extending love to people. That the, you're not just praying that the, some dove is going to come out of the sky and say, God loves you. And they're going to feel good. God loves you. No, but they see it through relationship. Because so many of us believers are so stuck up in our belief. It's all, oh, I got mine. What's wrong with you? No. I want to make sure you know. And when people walk through our church or any church, but I can only be responsible for this one. When people walk in any of our campuses or see any of you out the mall, that they get a sense of love. That you say hi to people. That you ask them how they're doing. You look them in the eye and say, how can I pray for you? And you mean it. That's why our small groups are so important, and I can't encourage all of you to get in a small group. Why? Because you have people, it's not just a big crowd, it's you have people that can look you in the eye and say, how can I encourage you? How can I love you? Well, that's why it's so critical to get in a small group. You are not going to grow to the degree God wants you to grow sitting in here listening to me. 
It's not going to happen. We're not even trying to make that happen. I'm preaching my guts out, but I know this is only a small part of it. It's when you get in a group of people who know you and that can say, what are your needs? How can I encourage you? Who are you? That's where it happens. So I can't encourage you enough to get in a small group. But we're going to pray here in a minute. And there's two groups of you. Some of you have never asked Christ to be your Savior. God's never forgiven you. You're full of unforgiveness. God wants to forgive you. He is willing and able. He is willing and able. And then there's some of you who you've already done that, but you know what? You need, you need a fresh touch. You need some encouragement. Because if you don't sense the love of God, if you feel unlovable, you're going to lose hope. And the devil's going to slowly, slowly drive a big wedge between you and your loving father. We don't want that to happen. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know, and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.